Back here at home, a Texas man accused of murdering his wife is hoping to be released on bail. Sam Ricagliano reports at first, it seemed his wife died of a drug overdose. But then autopsy results revealed she had been strangled and she was nine weeks pregnant. He's charged with strangling his pregnant wife, but still called on the judge to release him. Does that mean I'm getting a bond today? The judge thought about it for maybe a second. No. When he returned to court today, the judge set bail at a million dollars. 38-year-old computer consultant Lee Gilly stands accused of killing his wife, Krista, who was nine weeks pregnant with their third child. The physical therapist seemed happily married, posting this wedding photo on her Facebook page. Liza McGilvery is Krista's best friend. Krista was the best mom, and that's what she lived for. She was so excited to have a third child. Cops say Krista's husband called 911 saying she had committed suicide with a drug overdose, but police say there was evidence of bruising and trauma to her face. Legally, apparently told investigators the couple had gotten into some kind of an argument over the purchase of a vehicle earlier in the day. And here's a disturbing fact. Homicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women. Most people are shocked that this is happening to women at the frequency that it is. Just being pregnant increases your risk of this thing happening. Gilly has been charged with capital murder. If convicted, he faces either life in prison or the death. What you just seen there was some footage of a man that uh, killed his pregnant wife. And as we mentioned in the last video, homicide is the number one leading cause of death for pregnant women while they're pregnant and even after they're pregnant. And it's higher even in the black community. And the reason why we're going to talk about this thing is because I promise you guys, we're going to talk about the abortion issue. You know, I mentioned in the last video about me not wanting my son and about, uh, about how I, my oldest son, where I was willing to possibly take someone's life in order to not make it happen. But, you know, I've thought about something because there's another situation that happened prior to that. So we're going to get into it. So you're going to, you know, I asked you guys in the last video to pray for me. I'm sure many of you did. Um, and this is going to be, I'm laying it all out there because you have these pro-life people out here that are going about the whole situation, I believe wrong and that they actually have done more damage within the church community. And I'm going to show you the glory of God of how and what he did in my life. And it's going to be a lot within here. Some of it's going to seem far-fetched or whatever, but God is my witness. I'm going to be honest with you guys, as I always have been, and I, a video may be a little bit longer than normal, but as you saw there, that woman, this picture you see here, this guy's Bobby Cutts. He was a cop. He was an officer that cheated on his wife, and he ended up getting this girl lady pregnant. And his wife, him and his wife reconciled and he paid child support to this woman that he had the affair with. Guess what? He didn't stop having an affair with her. Ended up, got her pregnant again. And the end result was he murdered her while she was pregnant with that child. Another case. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Of course, we know the famous cases, Lacey Peterson and all, I mean, all of that. But let's get to me. Let's get to me. Now, Something I thought of before making this video, I'm going to give you a, a story. Uh, when I decided to drop out of college to sell drugs full time at the age of 19, because the money was so good at that time, I got myself involved with a whole lot of shady characters and into a whole nother world that I had no knew no clue about. And I was out there. And very naive coming from where I was, the way that my aunt raised me, not knowing the dangers of being out in the streets the way that I was. And I found myself out there involved with people doing all kinds of things. And then I started getting involved with the girls, having a great old time. And I got one pregnant. And this is before the story of my son right here. This one particular one that this dawned on me, I got her pregnant and she refused.
refused to get an abortion because I insisted because you weren't going to mess up my life at the age of 19, 20 uh, years old and going on at that time, probably about 20 about that time, to mess my life up. And I felt like you weren't going to hinder me. And she did not want to do anything uh, as far as get rid of that. And I devised a plan with this particular one. I was going to lure her, asked her to go on a date, go to a hotel. And then I was going to start an argument with her. And then I was going to beat her up and try to attempt to make her lose the child. She uh, sent something was extremely wrong. She sensed it was extremely wrong and she felt like I was up to something and it never happened. Lo and behold, a few weeks later, I get a call from her, her cousin. She had been in a bad car wreck and she cousin called to tell me that she lost the baby and she was seven months pregnant at that time. And because uh, I, I was trying to do things to try not to get this thing to happen. And I just figured, you know what, I'm just going to leave her this letter. I won't be bothered with her. And, and I just have a kid out there and I won't know anything. But this cousin called me to tell me that she had, uh, 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 you know, they had to induce the labor on her, whatever. And the baby died. And I was so wicked because I wasn't saved at this time. But I was so mean. I remember telling her cousin. You tell her that's what she get because I told her to get the abortion and that's what she get and slam the phone down. My heart. I mean, I was wicked. I was very heartless. I don't seem like it. I mean, the Lord changed me, but I was heartless when it came to this, my old ways and several couple, a year or two later, I was involved with this woman that I was kind of messing around with on and off. And she ended up pregnant. And I remember telling her at that time, I, you, and I said, you gonna get an abortion? And I remember I was eating some cereal. <laughs> and next thing I know, <laughs> the cereal goes flying. She attacks me and starts to fight me. And what are you talking about? This, that, or that. And then her words was, as I mentioned, in the other previous video, you lay, you pay. And I'm like, oh, what has happened? And so what I did was, now I want you guys to listen closely. I started to devise, what can I do to get rid of this child? So we got in fights and she wouldn't miscarriage. I pulled a gun on her, threatened to blow her head off and Fortunately, did not pull the trigger because I had the gun inside her mouth with her hair like that when she, you know, right in her mouth and threatened to blow her head off. And thank God I didn't. And that didn't, you know, that situation didn't uh, uh, come about. So I went back to some old roots. Some of you that's followed me for a while know that I found myself in the occult world based upon a dream that the devil utilized. This is why dreams, guys, for those of you that are out here that mess around with stuff and realize some of these false teachers in them that are claiming that they're having all these visions and dreams all the time and just like that. Satan can masquerade as an angel of light because he did it to me at age 10 years old, masquerading as my dead father and caused me to be angry. And next thing I know, I was into what it call. What I did was, so when I was in California at, during my college years, I, so we befriended and had some friends that were, they were into white magic or some type of magic or whatever. They played, they did tarot cards, crystals, and, and Ouija boards. And that was my first experience with the Ouija board. But prior to that, from, my, from 10 years old up until that years of getting into college, I was into, uh, 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 you know, dream books, uh, calling up the dead, uh, all types of things that dealt with the occult. So the devil was already with me in such a way and working on me and messing around with that Ouija board, open Pandora's box 
like never before from when I was in college like that. And I went back and I said, you know what? I went and got me a Ouija board and I began to talk to the devil. And I told the devil, you can have this child. I don't want this child. It's yours. I don't want him. Take him. Take her. And I was praying to him constantly to take her life. Take it. Take the child's life, somebody's life. And I begun to, something wasn't right. And I believe now that I'm a believer, I believe that I was possessed. I truly believe I was possessed. I was in a fog constantly, in a constant rage to where I could have took someone's life at any moment because I felt like I could snap just like that. And I remember waking, sleeping in the bedroom where at the apartment, because this was at her place when I was playing with this board. And what then happened was I didn't, the evil spirits have taken up residence in that place because I allowed them to come in like that, not knowing. And I was awakened one night, sleeping in the room, hearing sounds as First off, when I was asleep, I dreamed of the Ouija board. And then I was awakened with these sounds hitting each corner of the room. And it freaked me out because I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It was a weird feeling. She knew something wasn't right, but she was talking to some Christian guy at her job is what she was doing. And she was talking to him and he was telling her, he, you cannot have no Ouija board in your house. He is playing. This is dangerous. This or that. She come home and tell me you got to get rid of this Ouija board, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And I was obsessed with the board. I wouldn't get rid of it. And I did not know what was going on. And there was an evil presence felt in the room. And I remember telling one of my best friends that God, uh, uh, he's passed on the way now that was out in the streets. Unfortunately, I told him hardcore street guy. I said, you have to come into this room and feel what's going on. He went into the room. When he went, I took him there to the apartment. He goes up to the room. It's, I still laugh at this today because he goes up to the room and he comes back downstairs, gets his jacket and his keys and walks out of the house. I, I'm out of here, Reese, because that's what the, the people will call me, nicknamed Reese, R-E-E-S-E. -E. I'm out of here, Reese. He was gone because he felt the evil presence. So I call myself not saved or whatever. I figure, okay, I'm going to do, a, I guess, a casting out of the devil, the evil spirits of the home. I'm going to get a cross. I'm going to get a Bible. And I went there one afternoon because now the, the, the mother of my uh, child to be here, what was going on there, she had left the apartment. She was no longer there. She was staying at her mom's at this point or somewhere else. Because she felt the evil presence there. She ended up, uh, uh, yeah, I ended up coming back one evening with the Bible. And I called myself reading Psalms 23 as I didn't seen out of a movie. And when I got to, I shall fear no evil, the Bible page turned. Like, <laughs> I dropped the Bible. And left that place freaking out. And it was to this day, I mean, it sounds silly. It sounds like a movie, but that happened. For those of you, I don't know, that has had some spiritual experience. Let me know. But it happened. I wasn't saved or anything. At that point, now I'm scared. And then I found out as I did research and someone, I don't know how I found out, someone talked to me and was telling me about how dangerous it is to play around with something like that. And then, now I'm scared and I go and I say, Lord, I remember being, uh, 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 now I'm like, Lord, oh my God, I'm sorry. Lord, I, I didn't mean to play with the devil. Lord, I didn't know. I, and, and, and I remember laying there in that apartment one night when she actually came back, she was upstairs and I was on the couch and she's, I, I'm praying and crying as 
asking God for forgiveness for, oh my God, Lord, what have I done? What am I doing? Playing with, I don't want these demons and or spirits or whatever or so. And I'm crying, talking to him. And I see this dark circles more so coming down the stairs. It was probably about 11, 12, 13. It was this coming down the stairs, coming, and they, and, and as I kept praying and praying and, and apologizing to the Lord, it kept, they like formulated right there in the living room. And then whew, it went out the window and it was probably about three in the morning at this time. And I remember there was a bright light that came through that living room window. And I got up to see like who's got their headlights flashing towards, you know, the, the deal. And there was nobody out there. I didn't know what was going on. But now once I became saved, I realized that the Lord, that was the Lord. That was the Lord. That he removed them evil spirits out of the place and things like that. And I decided that even though I left the board, me and her, I eventually decided that I was going to just walk away because I couldn't get rid of this child. So I just figure I'll go on with my life and forget about her. And that's what I figured. Now we get to the point. At that point, I'm going on about my life. Back to the streets, selling dope, hanging out with the people, meet some other girl, call myself getting engaged or something like that, <laughs> crazy and all of that. But then in October of 1992, maybe a couple months later before that, the Lord was already breaking me down. All of my drug friends, some were murdered. Some were locked up in prison. One of my main connections had to lay low because it was the feds were on to them. And it's like the Lord put me in this box and I was weary. I was tired. Family members were hooked on drugs and I was tired of seeing them strung out. And here, I, 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 but I had two Christian friends that I grew up with that never, ever sh shamed me. Always were there, treated me right, listened to me, still was a friend. And, I, and I'm still, they're still my best friends to this day. And I didn't know, but I, I knew my one best, my one friend, big, we'll call him Big Mark. I knew that he went to church all the time and, and things. And I called him up. I said, man, come get me. I'm ready to go to church. And he was like, you're lying. You're lying. You're lying. And, and he came and picked me up that Sunday morning. My heart, my, my, I was set on giving my life to the Lord that Sunday. I had had enough. And I go on about my business. Now, mind you, still no contact with this woman that's pregnant with my child or so. Uh, uh, now, he's born in January 13th of um, uh, 1993. So, I mind you, I'm, I got saved towards the end of October 1992. Going on about my life, moseying along. My family, I didn't even tell my family that I had this child until three months after he was born. I walk in the house with the baby and they're like, whose baby is this or so? But before even doing that, showing them the baby while I was going to church, the Lord was working on me because one day the pastor was setting, he was preaching about kids, talking about children being a blessing from the Lord, uh, 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 a gift from God and all of these, you know, preaching and talking. And he told this story about and I'm just going to paraphrase it the best way I can about the uh gar some uh, somebody a gardener somebody in a rose garden and, and a guy that was in uh the owner was getting ready told him I want you to take care of all of these flowers or roses in here and I have one special flower or rose back in the back that I want you to keep uh uh special take special care of and I'll be back at some point. And this guy 
uh, gardener or whatever he was, took care of everything and took care of every day and did his duties. And then one day he went back to the back to take care of that special flower or rose or whatever. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was. And it was gone. He freaked out, had no clue what was going on. And finally the owner comes back and he tells him, I, I took care of everything, but that one rose that you told me to take special care of is gone. And the, and that gardener or owner or whatever told him, said, well, you did what you're supposed to do. But all of these flowers or roses are mine. And I gave you a job to take care of them and keep them. And I come for them when I'm ready. And he was talking about how the Lord has given you a responsibility. Now this is my pastor was talking about. The Lord has given you a responsibility and blessed you or so with a child and things. And then this is where it really got heavy. He was talking about that mother. This is my pastor was saying the mother every night when she wakes up and no help financially. She's struggling to make ends meet with this child crying and trying to make milk or find some way to get milk or something like that. He said, the Lord has a spiritual chalkboard up on, up on his next to his throne. And he was like, your name is on there. And every time there's a check mark, <laughs> he was saying that as, as, as far as your deeds that you're doing, your ways that you've misbehaving and everything that you are doing to miss, see that your child is being uh, uh, abandoned and, take, and not taken care of. And I'm like, whoa, I'm sitting there in the service like, oh, man, that's heavy. And um, I'm like, and then I'm like, well, God gave me, you know, this is a responsibility. And then God tells me, I hear the small, still voice because I was so on fire and excited to be saved. But I heard the small, still voice of God where he said, you can't serve me and not take care of your kid. That's what he said. You can't serve me and abandon your kid. And that shook me. That was the turning point. That was the turning point. And then he validated it with confirmation from my neighbor who was a reverend that knew that I had walked away from the child, didn't want anything to do with this child and was having arguments and problems with this woman. And he called me over as he always did when I was young. And he come over and he'll say, young man, Reverend Montgomery was his name. He said, young man, come here. Let me tell you something. He said, I don't care how bad she misbehaved. I don't care what is going on. Don't you ever abandon and mistreat or don't take care of your child. He said, get you, I know you get you, uh, get send money orders to her, keep the receipts money. However, because I wasn't paying child support or anything at that time. She hadn't officially like taken me down yet or anything. Um, but I can, he said, send her what you can, keep everything. And you be faithful. And he would always say this. He would finish it off. And the Lord will bless you. That's what he would always say. I kind of get teared up hearing that. Because he would always say that when I was younger. Because I was angry. And he would, I would be mad. And he would see me mad at 12, 13 years old. And just angry. And didn't want to be bothered with nobody. Despite, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, act like I didn't want my aunt to tell me to do anything and he would tell me young man you be thankful that your aunt came into your life and don't you ever miss be uh mistreat uh her or any other adults and things like that and, it, and it's like it straightened me up but the fact that he sat there and said that uh in you know in after the lord spoke to me in that small, still voice within the church service to tell me that you can't serve me 
if you walk away from this child. And why I'm, I kind of need to slightly go back. What happened was too, during that time before he was born and right before I came and called my friend Big Mark up to tell him that to give my life over to the Lord that I want to go to church now, I was going to kill myself. I don't know if I've made a video yet where I wrote the suicide note. If I told the test, I think I made it, told you guys about the, that's a whole experience there. I think there is a video on that where I told the testimony about the night when I was going to take my life and how God intervened on that. But there were several times in my life where I've attempted or thought of taking my life just because I, my motto was nothing never works out. I might as well go join my mother since my father and mother died. And I, I felt like God didn't care because I used to say, God, you don't care. You don't care about me. Why me? Is what I would say. Why did you let this happen to me? Why couldn't it be to this person? Why do you, you know, and that was my argument with him all the time. Why me? Why me and my brother? Why did you do this? And things like that. And this is, if you're out there and you were asking that same question, why me, why me, why me? I understand. It's tough. And the anger, but he loves us enough to... He saved me and took that away from me, that bitterness and anger that I had that I was carrying around to where I just wanted to do harm to any and everybody. I was telling my wife there, she never knew this, but I was telling her that I was so angry. I understand these school shootings and all of these things that go on with these when kids are being bullied. I know I had to fight for my life from dealing with bullying and, and, and I hated seeing other people being bullying and just the anger of my life and the weight and the situation I was, I, I, I used to, was freaking out. I wanted to figure out how to make a pipe bomb. I wanted to do some harm to some people. I remember in 10th, uh, 10th 11th grade, I was telling her, we used to tell her a weekend, I threatened the whole gym. Now, you know, that this would be national, you know, on the news, not maybe, you know, where you would be on the news, where I told the history teacher and my basketball coach, I said, I will blow this mother F, you know, place up is what I, I told, said. I'll blow everybody up. I was angry, really angry. So I thought of taking my life and checking up out of here. But while this woman was pregnant, because I was just done with it. I was done with it. And my other best friend, which happens to be a Christian, Chad, I was talking to him about all of this stuff. And thinking, you know, where I told him I don't care about that child and I'm not going to be there because I'm probably going to take myself out at some point and this or that. And the first thing he, he said, why would you do something like that? Talk like that. He said, I've watched you grow up without your dad and watch the pain and the things that you went through without him. Why would you take this child through the same thing? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see, these are true friends. And he told me that that was a wake up. Now, that happened before I was saved. And then it transitioned. But you see what the Lord was doing? The reason why I'm sharing all of this is because I want to share with you at the end. Reverend Ed, uh, this about abortion and really, I think that this puts the cap on what I'm trying to say on everything. Uh, uh, what I've been trying to say or what I want to say. I think he puts it in, in a great form. The whole point is that for what people don't understand is that you think that laws is going to do this or that. We've got laws for drinking and driving, but do people stop drinking and driving? Do people stop killing people on the road with alcohol related deaths? Do you people, we got laws for drugs, drug use, drug selling, all of that. 
Do you think that, I mean, you always talk about fighting the cartels and this or that. They wouldn't have no business if Americans and people around the world, you know, could, uh, uh, stop using drugs. It doesn't go anywhere. And just like what Reverend Ed says, as I will let this, when I'm finished talking, I'm going to watch that and I'll let that play out so you can see. Reverend Ed talks about, it might tweak some numbers just a little bit here and there, but it ain't going nowhere. Abortion wouldn't go nowhere. You know what will happen? The cartels will have a new hot commodity and it will be the, the pills. That will be, Man, they'll be selling them like hotcakes. That's what will happen. Everything will go underground. Everything, nothing will change. It will be, you think so. And, and here's the main thing. Right here, people's hearts won't be changed. And as you see, why do I wanted to tell you this testimony is that the Lord changed my heart because the women are always getting a raw deal. It ain't, it's the men think they want to control these women and this, that, or that. But the men, men like me at that time, was going to walk out on my kid and leave a kid as you got all of these, I don't know what's the amount of kids out there that's fatherless because deadbeat dads. And it doesn't matter. There's poor deadbeat dads. There's rich deadbeat dads. There's a guy named Darren, uh, uh, well, Dar I was thinking of Darren Mack. Uh, I, I, I would call him, well, he was a deadbeat dad. Darren Mack was a pawn shop owner that was, I think, making 500000 a year. He was big money and killed his wife in, his, in, in, her, in the house because they were going through a divorce. Didn't want to pay for the, uh, his support prior to that. Arguing with the judge. Let the house heat cut off and... He, and the judge ordered uh, up in the support or something crazy. And from 100 yards in the parking garage, some of you might know this. So I think it happened in Nevada. He shot that judge from a parking garage with a sniper style right in his chambers, right in between the chest. And the judge lived, though. But it was a manhunt for this dude. Darren Mack left his, left his kids without any parents. But he didn't want to take care of of his wife because she wanted a divorce. I mean, is there it? So it don't matter if it's money, this or that, or none of it. There's dead beats all the way across the board, and I was going to be one of them. I did not want that child. And you have these men that want to put all the laws, this or that, but it's okay for them to not pay their child support. It's okay for them to set up and uh, 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 kill a woman. Or so because they mad because she is tired of the abuse or tired or wants to leave and things like that. Or you want to have multiple kids. But no one talks about how about we even this thing out then? If you want to play it like that. I always thought of that. Well, how about a vasectomy? If you if you you got two two kids, you get a pass maybe on one, but if you got two kids or, or, or so, uh and you're not taking care of them and things like that, boom, it's automatic state-ordered vasectomy. Done. You can't have any anymore for men. How about that? See, they don't want that. How about your Viagra's and Cialis's and all of that since you want to mess with women's birth control and all of these things? How about take that away? Let's make the thing even. I mean, you see, it can, it can go both ways. But the whole point is, is that if you don't change the heart or in... And on top of it, as what Reverend Ed talks about, which is another, that's the whole issue, is the other issue as far as the uh, uh, the child care issues, the financial issues. You know, that's, that's the thing, the root of the problem. You act like that women just want, like they just want to do it. Man, this is a tough decision. I've been around women. I've talked with them women. I've been with women that struggle with, they thought that the guy loved them and was wanted to be with them because they were searching for love because they were broken. And they were searching for a relationship only to get strung out to dry by giving themselves over to the man. Now they're pregnant and they're torn and don't know what to do. And, it, and you think that this is something as 
they just willingly want to do here and there. And this, and it shows the lack of compassion. Man, that's a tough situation to be in. It's a tough situation to be in. I know th three, one, two women. I know two women where their daughters were raped by one by a father and one by a stepfather and impregnated them. I know that. <laughs> and then I know others, several others that were raped by a family member or something as a teenager. And, and, and it's her, these stories are horrendous. And, you know, laws need to be changed because I think personally, any rape of a child should be an automatic life sentence. Automatic, no parole, you're done. Because many of these people, to me, that mess with children or rapists, because that goes as far as rape too, I believe life with no parole. If you rape a woman, life with no parole. Because I don't think many of the people that's like that, I think the odds of the rehabilitation is slim. Very slim. So they need to be locked up for good. Especially if you take the innocence of a child. And um, so people need to have a better understanding. So as, as, a, as the church, as we bring this thing to a close, and I'm going to play the Reverend Ed uh, video for you. As a church, we got to do better. You got to be do better with this. Trying to, you need to educate yourself. You need to ask the Lord to open your heart, open your mind. What ways can we do things to make it better so that when women, the ones that or have come up with the situation that's not the medical side of it, but they've encountered a situation where, man, I don't know whether I want to keep this kid or not. I don't know what to do or not. That we have placed the proper things in society in place, and we put the education there in place. And as a church, we've done the things that Jesus has told us to do about us as far as conducting ourselves so that they can feel comforted through their stressful and very stressful time. So that's what I have to share with you. I know, like I said, this is my longest video ever. Um, we may go live at some point here, try to. I mean, this, I've been trying to get these videos out because out, 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 I want you guys to, uh, this is the most I've ever made in a week. And I want you guys just to hear this because somebody needs to hear this. Because the Lord changed me. I love my child. Me and my son is close. He's grown now. He's 31, going on 32. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I love my kids. I got, I got three kids. For those of you that um, don't um, know, I got my, my Brandon. Um, then I got um, Marquise. And then my daughter, Monet. So she's 19, 25. 31. That's them. So, and as you can see there in the picture, these are my, these are my babies. So, um, I hope that this is a, you know, something that opens your eyes for all of, all of you, regardless of, like I say, whatever's going on in, in your uh, life, the Lord will touch your heart and move when necessary. And don't, as I close, don't be the one that somebody down the road will say, you know, it was a time when I was going through something really rough and this or that. And this particular person, I shared something with them or they acted towards me like a, a, in a way and it, and it was just it messed me up. You know, certain hurts last for the lifetime. Some of you are guilty of that, hurting people, and, they've, and they're have they going to carry that hurt to their grave. I don't want to be responsible for doing something like that. I don't want to be, as a Christian, I do not want somebody to say, Maurice, you hurt me and did things to, you know, as far as the way you conducted yourself, and that hurt me to the core, and I've never gotten over that. 
Don't, don't do that. So here's Reverend Ed, Evangelism for God is the channel. Maurice Braxton is my name. Where we talk about issues the church run away from, take the devil head on or what else, punch them right in between the chops. Until the next video, my friends, take care. God bless. But babies being born rather than aborted. If I really, if as a Christian, I want to reduce the number of abortions, I really want to, I really want to reduce the number of abortions and not the medical needed ones, the medically, the, the medical uh, required ones, but rather the ones where people say, I just don't want to be pregnant. If I want to really, truly, genuinely do that, I'm not going to do it through legislation because it won't, the numbers won't actually go down all that much. I may discourage a few people, but it, it won't work. If I really genuinely want to do that, I will focus my time and my energy working on the things that make abortion feel necessary, feel like an option. So what I mean by that is, I guess I don't see this as a problem as much as a symptom of a series of problems, uh, a symptom uh, of a compilation of problems. Poverty, education, uh, a living wage. Um, you know, what am I going to do after after the, the child is born? So if, if you really want to, if, if the Christians out there really want to be involved, really want to make this a thing of the past, then what I would encourage you to do is, is ask yourself, what are the, why, why? Is this an option? Why is it that people feel this is the only option? And then tackle those issues. Again, poverty is a big one. People's careers getting started. Health care, child care is a big one. Education is a big one. Like there's lots of reasons here that, that we, can, we can actually legislate solutions for. There's a lot of things we can do that, that will help reduce that, that number. Right? My Christian life is not about that issue. But if I actually live this Christian life, so, and again, this is where I know nobody would say, well, that's not, of course, that's not all being a Christian is about. But if I spend my life as a Christian focused on that issue, yeah, sure, maybe I will reduce the numbers. Okay, but I won't help in any of those other things. Any of those other things like that we know contribute to, to those numbers going up. I won't be I won't be doing anything to reduce those things. I'll just be putting legislation in place that make it illegal. I'll put legislation in place that will punish people and hope that that punishment uh, is enough of a deterrent that they that they don't do it. But if I focus on doing the things that Jesus actually tells me I'm supposed to focus on, if I focus, if I actually focus my time and my energy on taking care of the people that Jesus tells me to take care of in the ways that Jesus tells me to take care of those numbers will go down. Yeah, they will. I'll be taking care of the real problem. I'll be taking care of the real issues. And as I take care of the real issues, that will become less and less a thing that feels like the only alternative. If, we, if we're living this life, as Jesus tells us to live this life, we're taking care of the people that Jesus tells us to take care of. We're taking care of them in the ways that Jesus tells us to take care of them. The world's going to be a better place, right? Like if nothing else happens, you're going to make the world a better place. I'll be, I'll be taking, I'll, I'll be, I'll be ridding the world of, of the barriers, the hurdles, the hurdles that, that so many would see as a reason to, to not go ahead with the pregnancy. For what it's worth, one of the two parties in the US who is running, you know, right now for the president, only one of those two parties actually is seeking to put policies in place that would tackle so many of those issues. And, 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 and oddly enough, that party is also the one who is pro-choice. 
it, I find it I find it ironic that, that the party who is pro-choice and therefore the one who is pro-murder in the eyes of so many people are actually the same ones who are um, pro-taking care of people, pro-living wage, pro-education, pro-health care, pro-child care. That party, that, that pro-choice party is also the ones who are working, whose policies will work to reduce so many of the reasons why people, why women, may choose to have this procedure to, to terminate a pregnancy. Isn't that interesting? I, the side that is pro-life, well, they seem to believe that all those issues that uh, that add to a person's add to a person feeling as though they need to have this procedure. They're they're completely okay with those things staying in place. And as a matter of fact, would blame the people for exper experiencing the hardships uh, in the first place. Anyhow, amen.